was that okay let's get this up and running and we are live we just have a session sound about logical and get this cable out of the way logical and physical join operators operator just save that real quick okay I hope there's uh, some kind of save mechanism here um, we can edit this later okay this time it is about um, logical and physical join operators so the agenda I didn't really uh, put out point out in a, in a PowerPoint but we were first dealing with um, logical join operator so we were talking about uh, nested loop join merge join and the hash join the, the, the most common joins not only in SQL Server but of course also in Oracle or other DB systems and afterwards we will have a look on the physical join operators which are then uh, uh, sorry th those are the physical join operators sorry the logical join operators we briefly talk about um, an inner join a left join which includes basically also a right join and a full join Sorry, now we have uh, to have a look at the physical joint operators and afterwards we talk about execution plans, exit plans and uh, a few uh, yeah, properties of the physical joint operators because the logical ones, to be honest, we don't have to touch so much. Let me just, uh, before we get into this really quick, uh, fire up on uh, Twitter the link to our YouTube channel that we are live right now um, copy a video URL and then we go here to my account and we just put in that we are live right now I mean I just said it but friendly reminder probably helps a lot Okay, so let's just join with uh, inner uh, with the logical join operators, and therefore we have to clarify um, what is actually an inner join or a left join and a right join, and what is a full join. So basically, we have three possible uh, scenarios right here. We have a le uh, an inner join that is the most common join, I think. The left join also very common. The right join not that common since it is basically a left join, just the other way around. Um, and we have the full join, of course. Get this mic a little bit up. So okay, so um, we jump right into um, a scenario here where we can, I think, grasp grasp very um quickly what join operator does what thing. So I hope you know what joins are in general. I mean, you you join two tables means that you um means that you connect those basically but you have of course to uh, specify how you want to connect those um, those tables so for instance now we have here a table um, called um, DBO schools where we just have a school ID that is just a running identity then we have a school name here and we have a simple table called DBO persons where we just have a person here it also gets a person ID then we have a full name of the person and the person may attend the school since it's may attend a school, it can also be null. And since it's null, it can't be a foreign key constraint. So I put no foreign key constraints to schools, but it seems to be obvious since the name school ID is the same that I want to connect those two uh, on school ID. So the first one we want to talk about is basically a left join. A left join is, uh, sorry, an inner join. We start, of course, with the inner join because it's the most common one. The inner join connects both tables on the school ID. Let's just type this real quick. We select um, everything from 
dbo persons call this a and we join it with the schools table on the column school id and in a join is the same as if i would type inner join so no matter if i type join or inner join it is always an inner join so what this will now do is it will connect um it will list every person and every connected school but only if they have a connection partner that means let's have a look at the person so look we have jedi academy sys academy and beer academy okay so this is obviously getting id one two and three then we have luke skywalker with id one darth vader with person id two and we have arthur the lich king with uh, obviously id three we'll just build those tables and we have a look on them uh first on the persons table we see here I hope you can see it. I put the resolution a little bit up. Um, we have here, uh, okay, person ID 1, Luke Skywalker, attends school ID 1. Person ID 2, Darth Vader, attends school ID 2, and Arthur Ditching attends no school at all. And we have also the, the schools table. Let's just have a look at, at this real quick. Um, yeah, it's not actually quick since the server is remote. And okay, we have B Academy of School ID one, Sys Academy of School ID two, and B Academy of School ID three. If we now connect those um, together, we will quickly see that Arthur the Lich King has no match on the on the schools table. Hence, he won't be displayed here. If you can see here, you see Luke Skywalker connected through the school ID with his Jedi Academy, and we see Darth Vader here connected through the school ID with the Sys Academy. An inner join only displays. Um, a result set that had that ha actually had a match on this on this criteria here, and since the that way that, uh, sorry other the Lich King and Beer Academy is not assigned to any of it, we won't see either. This is basically um, in an inner join. Then let's come to a left join. We have to put it explicitly a left join here. A left join coming from persons over schools means that we list everything that is in DBO persons and we have a look at the schools table and if we have a match then we put it if we have no match we just don't put it but we still put the role from persons we don't just let them disappear like we did it just before so a left join now should also display Arthur the Lich King with uh, school ID null and school name null yeah right there we have it so but it is not swallowed, swallowed this row, this is uh, still visible here. So now we still don't see the beer academy, right? So this is because we come from the left table, so this is the person's table in this case. And it doesn't uh, have anything to do with the beer academy, so we can't display it. We could go th no, the other way around. We don't go to, to every list, uh, to every row of person's table and display a matching partner if there is one and just null if there is nothing. We could also do the same with the schools table. So we go through every row of the schools table and match, um, match uh, and output the row if a match is there. So then we have to put here a right join because then we come from the right table and do the same thing. And as you can see here, then we have exactly the situation. We, we start with Jedi Academy, we find Luke Skywalker. We start with Sith Academy, we find Darth Vader. And then we, with B Academy, we don't find anything, but we still display it here. But here with nulls because we can't show, uh, find anything. Problem now is that uh, we don't see uh, the, the, the Arthur the Lich King anymore. So now there's a combination basically of left and right join. And this is called a full join. A full join basically is a left join and a right join and those uh, result sets combined. So now we see everything. We see Luke Skywalker with this matching uh, school. We see Darth Vader with his matching this academy. We see Arthur the Lich King has no match and we see the B Academy with no match. So we, with a full join we basically see everything. It's basically the opposite of an inner join. Well, an inner join would only display us the first two rows. A uh, full join would display all four rows. This is, would be a left join and this would be a right join. So since this is actually very easy and you can find uh, many information also um, not on my channel yet because I didn't focus on logical things but more on physical join operators here. Um, you can still find it everywhere. It's, re it's really basic understanding of joins. So if you are interested in more stuff then and you really want me to do something about logical join operators feel free to ask me and I will do it um, again in a dedicated video of course. 
So since this is more or less clear now for you, hopefully um, we can switch over to physical joint operators. And let's just have a look at the agenda real quick. So we have here um, the nested loop joint, this is the most simple joint, the merge joint and the hash joint. So for nested loop joint and merge joint, I don't have so much to say. We will see a small PowerPoint I did once uh, with an uh, example real detailed, but I don't prepare so much um, bullet points for this. Let's just talk about the nested loop joint real quick. So as it may indicate, um, you have two loops in the nested loop joint, an outer loop and an inner loop. In the inner loop and the inner loop is the nested loop and therefore this is called the nested loop joint. So if we have a look at our tables and we want to do a, just a normal join between persons and schools, the nested loop joint would do like this. It would go for every row of the schools, uh, of the persons table. So we start with the persons table. Look through every row of the schools table. So we would start for Luke Skywalker. Is it connected to this? Yes. Connect to this? No. Connect to this? No. Okay. Output Luke Skywalker, Skywalker with Jedi Academy. Then we start with Darth Vader. Is it connected to this? No. Is he connected to this? Yes. Output. Is he connected to this? No. Don't output. Okay. Last one. Arthas. Is he connected to this? No. Is he connected to this? No. And is he connected to this? No. So don't output anything. This would a nested loop joint do. It would loop through every row of the per for each row of the person table. For each row, he would do. Um, he would scan each school. So if we have. If we have like n schools and m uh, persons, it would uh, take n times m, um, uh, yeah, operations. And if we assume that um, n is the bigger one, then it is a, a complexity of n square. So we have uh, a complexity of uh, o to n square. You you probably saw this notification. This uh, this in uh, computer science. So this is basically a, um, a complexity that is not very good. That means whatever our input is, we have to the power of two um, effort to this, so op times operation in this case, which is not good. And the O is just means uh, upper bound basically. So this is not very good. It's a very simple join. We will see an example now. I prepared once at one point. I hope my Excel does not fuck up here. Ah, fine. So this example is um, with um, a customer table and a customer name and with an invoice ID and the customer. So obviously a customer can be on different invoices and um, we have those table performing an inner join on obviously the customer ID. So it will start for each row of the outer table. So for the customer one and scan through every invoice we have. And if there is a pet matching partner, we will list it here in the result. So as you can see here, this is customer two, ID 2 not matching. This is customer ID 1 output this here. This is customer ID 3 don't output, don't output. This is a match, so output it. Now for the next row of the customer, the customer 2. The customer 2 has an immediate match with the first invoice, with the second invoice, but then not so much anymore, but we still have to scan it because we don't know it. And then finally for the outer row, uh, 3, we scan again the invoice table completely okay and now at this point we have our result um, it took a while and you saw it is not very efficient since we have to scan 3 times 6 so 18 in this case uh, times um, it, you did scan operations it's not very effective uh, if efficient effective it is but not efficient um, so this is the nested loop join very simple thing. It has also a few con a few uh, properties that I want to uh, catch up later when we're talking about execution plans. It may be not the, the fastest thing, but it's the most easiest thing. And it means you don't need any memory to perform an nested loop join. And it preserves the order of the outer table. And yeah, it is for small inputs, it's uh, the best solution since you really need no resources for this. So let's go on to a more complex thing. This is the merge join. Basically, the merge join is also a very simple thing. You know, the only thing on the merge join is that it needs in, input, uh, sorry, sorted input. So it, this input has to be ordered. So if we join on a customer ID, both tables, like in our example, both are 
both tables have to be sorted on the on the custom ID already because the merge join needs that. So there are basically two simple ways to achieve this in SQL Server. One thing is our clustered index or an index any index that can help us to um, to retrieve the the, the, the data uh, is already in that order. So we don't we just have to simply scan it, perform a full table scan a full uh, index scan of the scan on the leaf level, which we talked about uh, in the last live session, I guess. Did we? Yeah, we did. And yeah. This is one possibility. The second possibility is that SQL Server decides, okay, well, we have so so few rows. It is probably the best thing if I just sort it, like extra extra uh, to to uh, to be able to do the merge join, and then do the merge join. I also have a small example for a merge join. Mm, so the same tables again, and the customer ID is the join criteria again. So right here. Um, the other table is already sorted after custom ID. We see one, two, three. That's exact. That's 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 fine, right? But you see, for the inner table, it is not really um ordered right now. So we have to first change that. So now it is ordered after custom ID, and now we can do the merge scan. Uh, merge, merge scan. Yeah, the merge <laughs> join. The merge join basically it scans both tables simultaneously. It starts with the outer table and starts going down on the inner table. And as long as it finds customer IDs one in this case, it knows those are matching partners. As soon as the, 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 the second table sees a customer ID two, it knows, okay, all my customer IDs, since it is ordered, uh, I already read. So now we have to move on to customer ID two. And then the other table also switches to customer ID two and so on and so forth. We see this in this example right now. So we start with uh, both um, tables in the first row and we see right here there's a match. Then the second table moves its pointer. It is still on a custom ID, so we know, okay, this is also a matching partner. Now we get to custom ID two, and now the algorithm knows, okay, since this column here was ordered, um, we can't have any custom ID ones anymore. So we tell the other table, okay, please move your cursor to until you see custom ID two. Because custom I one clearly is not matching, as you see here, uh, marked red. So now we go on with custom ID two, and we scan again in the inner table until we until we read something different than two. Now we read three. Again, we have to tell the outer table, dude, I'm finished reading the twos. There are no twos anymore. Please move on to threes because I won't read any two again because I already am at three. And then the outer table also. Uh, switches to the next row to the three and then they uh, do this procedure again as you can see the output is of course exactly the same um, it is just uh, what we uh, what you also saw is that we just scan each table once in a nested loop join we scan the inner table as often as we had rows in the outer table but for a merge join we only scan both once of course downside of it we need sorted input and the merge join itself doesn't really take uh, needs any memory normally, but of course the sort operation that we may need before it to have those input uh, the sorted inputs that of course it may it will need memory. Okay, so again uh, as you can see we just switch here um, reading it uh, and just telling the auto table okay dude I'm finished reading my uh, my part just go on. This is um, the merge join actually also very easy but um, let's switch to the most sophisticated join of all the three join operators it's the hash join so the merge join is good if you already have a s sorted input somehow or you have small enough input on one side that you can just take to sort then it is good but for really really big tables like data warehouse queries where you have one big fact table and a smaller dimension table you want to join then this would no be good would, would, wouldn't be any good idea because the fact table probably isn't sorted at all. Then we have to take a hash join. So for hash join I have a, um, a PowerPoint in place that is a little bit more detailed. Let's go through this. And this is, we will take our time here and um, I will explain it uh, very carefully because this is the m most used join in bigger databases and it is also the most efficient join in 
big databases, so it's actually very crucial. So don't be afraid of the word hash here, by the way. The hash just means that you take a function, you put something in, and you get something out. And if you put the same thing in again, you get the same thing out. It's just basically a labeler or something like this. Just like a fingerprint of the row, basically. It's not that complicated for us. We use simplified hash for the example. So I will go into potential and prerequisites for the hash join. Uh, what is the actually the hash join? Uh, I will, of course, show you an example and we go through it. And uh, then we have to talk about memory consumption and sp memory spilling of the hash join. But we will get to that later. So start with the potential and prerequisites of the hash join. So as I told you, it's suitable for middle to large inputs, small or less large inputs. It requires at least one acquire join. Yes, you cannot acquire. Uh, you cannot do this hash join if you don't have any acquire conditions. So, just a condition um, A is greater than B won't uh, trigger the hash join. It supports all joins. We didn't talk so much about what um, join operator supports all, but I can tell you, merge join does not um, support all of them, and neither does nested loop join. So it supports left join, right join, a semi join, and an anti join. I didn't talk so much about this, but you would already know left and right joins. A semi-join is basically a join. If you join table A with table B, but you don't take any uh, column out of B, you just join it to see if there is a joining condition. This is called a semi-join. And an anti-join is the opposite of a join. You want rows not that match A and B table over a certain column, but you want uh, rows that are not matching over a certain column. So basically, uh, in our example, which we have right here, in an anti-join, we would want to see uh, Arthur Silage King and B Academy um, as a matching partner since they don't match at all. It's That's why it's called anti-join. So it uses a hash function. A hash function, as I told you, don't be afraid. It's basically like a fingerprint of the row. The row gets a label uh, based on its value and the same value has always the same um, label. So you have an input, you get it to a hash fun function and you get a hash output. And whenever the input is the same, the hash function will output the same hash. Yeah, it consists of two phases actually. It's not so simple as, uh, as uh, the other joins. I told you it's more sophisticated. And it has a first phase um, that is a blocking phase. We will talk about it. And this is uh, called the build phase. And then we have the probe phase, which is the second phase. It needs memory. Yeah, that's the only join that needs actually memory. Sorry. And that's basically it with the potential and the prerequisites. Going on with the definition of the hash join. I already spoiled you. It is, build, it is a build phase and a probe phase. In the build phase, we build a hash table. That means for each row in table one, we calculate a hash value of the acquire join columns. So of the join columns that are joined with an acquire join, we take this and calculate a hash value out of it. As I told you, if you have a one putting into the hash rate, get a certain label and the one will always get the same label. We will see this in the example, don't worry. Second. Second in this phase is we store the row in a hash table and we use the calculated hash as a key. So basically we take a row, calculate our hash um, on the join condition column and then we take a table, lookup table where we put uh, the key is our calculated hash and the value of this lookup table is just um, the row. So we can very quickly look up if we see, if we want to check, is there anything in this table with a certain label, we can um, access this row immediately in the hash table. That's, a, that's the point of a hash table. You can access it immediately in no time. The second phase, before we come to the second phase, we just talk a little bit more about the build phase. So the build phase just scans the smaller table. So in our definition, it is the table one, since the table one only consisted of three rows here, but it has to be the smaller table because otherwise it makes no sense for the hash join. We built the hash table of the smaller hash table. Hash, yeah, the hash table of, of the smaller table. And the hash table will contain for each row one key value pair. 
makes sense, right? For each row, we calculate the label of the column and it gets, um, it gets into the table. So table two, we don't touch in the build phase. We just touch smaller table one. In the probe phase, we touch now table two. For each row in the table two, we calculate also the hash value of the joint column. With this calculated value, we look up in the table we just created and check if we have an entry. So I told you that this check, if we have an entry in our table, that is like this label I have here. This is very quickly, can be, can be done very quickly in basically no time. So if there is a match, then again, then, then the columns will be um, checked uh, to make it sure. And then the, uh, the hash, the hash, uh, the, ma the matched row, sorry, will be outputted. Yeah, let's just see what I uh, talked about here. We will jump to the example soon. The example uses a simple hash function for demonstration purposes. Fowler null VO 32 bit with no avalanche effect. This is a certain hash function. Don't worry about it. The no avalanche effect means that, yeah, an avalanche effect is if you have a one and you hash it. And no, let's say otherwise. You have a word. Let's say we have a word and we hash it. Like we have the word dog, yeah, right? D O G, and we hash this. We get a certain label out of it, a hashed value a label. And we now uh, change from dog the G with a D, and we we, we hash the word dod. Then the aval an avalanche effect would be that the, the second label looks completely different than the first label. Although we exchanged only one letter in the word, the whole uh, hash looks completely different. So you cannot really say if two uh, when you have two hashes if the original value was very close. You don't know. For this hash, it has no avalanche effect. So a small uh, change in the input would also result in a small output uh, change. You can check out Wikipedia to learn more about the hash tables, but it's really not sophisticated. Let's just jump into our example we had for the last two uh, joints. For the last two joints, we have the inner, out in the inner table, now we have a build table and a probe table. The build table, as I told you, is always the smaller table of both. So here we have the custom ID one, we have a customer name, and we have a hash that is empty. We first have to do the build phase, and for each row, we have to hash custom ID one, okay? So we do this and the hash for custom ID one. So we take a one, put it into this box and the box puts out, okay, the one is a 050C5D2E, okay? The two is 050C5D2D, you see there's only this change here, E and D, E and D, so no avalanche effect obviously, because an avalanche effect would be here completely different hash. And your three would be a 050C5D2C. Okay, those are our hash values. This is the build phase. The build phase is now over since we um, build, it our build our hashes on the build table, right? So now come to the probe table. The probe table does the same thing. We go through it and we calculate on customer T ID 2 the hash value. It is 050C5D2D, like we have in the build table. So since we see here, okay, we take this hash now and look up in our build table, do we have this hash? And since this lookup is almost instant, we can see, okay, yeah, we have it. We have it here, uh, the custom ID 2, if customer ID name, uh, if customer name C2 actually matches. We can output it. For the next row, we do it again, and this is the same hash since we have the same customer, and we output this row. For the next customer, we do it again. The one calculates to this hash value, and we look it up in our table, and we see we have it here. So we output this and it goes on and on. The three calculates to this value. We look it up and find it here. The three again calculates to the same value and again the one in the end. So what we see here, we also scan each table only once, right? We scan it only once, the build table in the build phase once and the probe table we scan in the, uh, in the, in the, in the second, in the probing phase only once. And this lookup in the build table is basically done in zero time because this is a hash table and it is meant to be very fast at lookup. 
you just have to believe me this because uh, I can't really go into detail how a hash table is actually implemented. It is um, a binary tree that is uh, very effective in doing such things. I don't want to go into details, but you can basically think of it as a B tree. A B tree where you can just slide down and seek uh, on the values. It's basically the same. So here we have, um, but it is, uh, it's basically the same, but it has nothing to do with our B trees and our SQL server. Don't be confused. So the hash. Um, join has the um, good thing that we also have, like in the merge join, to scan our tables both only once. But the good thing is here, we don't have to sort our input. It does not need to be sorted. Um, the only downside of a hash table, re uh, of a hash join, really, is that we have to build this hash table, and the bigger this, the bigger the smaller table is. Um, the b more memory we need and if we have like 10 joins in one statement and we have much data we need to build 10 hash tables it can get quite messy with memory um, but in uh, normally it's a very fast way to join everything and also we don't need any indexes on the join uh, columns because it would make no difference we have to scan both exactly once it would make no difference if we do this on an index or not because we obviously have to dig through all of the rows for both tables and for both faces so it does not impact us really if we uh, can uh, reuse an index on it. Which is a good thing because in data warehouse queries you often have uh, big tables with many many rows you can't put really effective indexes on it often. Okay. So let's just talk about a little bit the downside of this thing, or maybe uh, what what with the memory is, because it's basically the only joint that really needs memory. So the required memory is guessed using the cardinality estimation, that is the statistics of our tables. So if you have two tables joined, we can relatively exact guess how many uh, rows we have. Okay, if you have two tables, we exactly know it, and how many memory we will need exactly we can guess it but if we have like four rows uh, four joints in a row for the fourth join that depends on three other joints before we cannot really guess how many um, rows will be will be there after three joints so we can only estimate this and the estimation gets worse and worse the more joints we have the smaller table will be the build table the problem here is that when we guess right, uh, like the fifth or sixth or whatever um, join in a row, we probably don't know and just randomly widely guessing how many rows will come through and how many rows we have to store in a hash table. So the chances of the hash table being not big enough because we guessed wrong is very probable. So if the memory is not sufficient in the build phase, the hash buckets that are the entries of the table that we cannot um, that we cannot hold into memory anymore because we have uh, we, we this table simply got too big we guessed wrong. Those buckets get written to disks, okay? To a disk. It's a work file in tempdb. It's not a memory. It's not uh, somewhere magical. It's in tempdb, okay? So this is for the build phase. If the memory is not sufficient in probe in the probing phase. Then we go. It goes like this: uh, if ta if a target hash bucket is on disk, from the spinning operation right here, we write the probe row also to disk. We don't do anything with it. We don't compare it with the uh, buckets we wrote to disk. We just put it also on disk. After our in-memory probing for our batches over with the things that we could hold in memory, we load the spilled rows and the spilled buckets to the memory. We recreate the hash table that we in the step before put onto the disk and we load all the rows we put to disk and now we do the same algorithm again. We, we build a hash table from the things we outsourced before and we go through every row that we outsourced before and then we go do the output. This process is redone if um, now also the memory again runs out. Uh, if this uh, runs in a loop and we and we just simply have too mem too few memory or too much rows, the last straw is a bailout algorithm um, that I don't want to um, talk about here because it would kindly blow 
probably blow a little bit uh, over the target here with our um, with our session but this make is not effective or not efficient but, uh, but it will terminate in the end so this is the thing about a hash join um, you need that memory for the table and if the, if your memory is not enough or your table is too big you have spilling and then it gets not so much efficient if you because um, you still in the end will only read every row from every table once but the thing is this um, putting to disk and putting back to memory thing this swapping right this is the worst thing you can basically do because your IO on your disk is very slow and this will slow down your whole join and it's better if it does not happen often so for hash join we have different patterns basically so see let me just uh you know, exactly so we have a, a left deep join that means hash join one is here we scan the table we scan that table we do the hash join hash join two has a imp left input from hash join 1 and a right input from the table and hash join 3 on top of that has the input from hash join 2 for the left side and the scan for the right side so I think the left side is the uh, building the building phase and the right side is the probing phase so in order to to probe this right input we have first to scan and build the hash table from the left input same for hash join 2 in order to um, to probe this input here this table we have to wait for the output of the hash join to build the to build uh, uh, our um, hash table on top of that and same goes sorry same goes for hash join three um, we have to scan first um, the we have to wait for the output of hash join two to build the, to build the hash table okay let's just focus on the uh, left deep join ah here we see it the left side is the build phase and the right side is the probe phase. Those hash joints are all full blocking. This is because um, the hash join tool needs to first build its hash table and its hash, ta hash table is, um, as you can see here, um, dependent from the from the previous hash join. The same for hash join 3. So each hash join, 4, 5, 6, if you do the, this more over, you see um, all need to wait for the previous join. That means they are all full blocking. They can't run in parallel or one after another or they can't be streamlined. But the good thing about this, the memory for the hash tables can be shared. What what does it mean? It does mean is when the hash join one is over, we have all of the input for hash join two table. But we don't need the hash join one hash table anymore. We can yeah, we can free the memory from this one. Because we don't need it anymore, we have we, we built a table here and we can scan the input. If this is done, we feed it to the hash table for hash hash join three, and we can also get rid of the memory and uh, reuse the memory. So the good thing is, we only need like the maximum amount of memory that one of those hash joins needs. But it is full blocking. This is the downside. As you can see here, max memory needs is basically the maximum memory usage of any hash join here. So the most, the opposite thing of this is the right deep join. As you can see here, hash join one, hash join two, and hash join three, all of them can build their input, their building phase, their hash tables, in parallel instantaneously because the input here and here and here is already, of course, there. It's some tables somewhere, so they can build hash table for hash join one, two, and three simultaneously. So that means it is also blocking, but only for the time of the build, and the build is in parallel now, not in serial. Downside of this, of course, is we cannot share the memory because we need to hold hash table one, two, and three until the scan here, the most uh, bottom right scan is over. So until the whole thing is over. So we need hash memory for all three hash tables, but we can build it par in parallel manually and we can streamline the read. So the maximum memory we need here is the sum of all the hash tables of all hash joins. But the good thing about this is that then once we have all those hash tables in memory, we can just go scan this through, probe it here, probe it here, probe it here, and we have the output. We don't have to wait for another build phase or anything like this. So this is basically um, what a hash join is all about. 
So we will come now to back to management studio because I want to talk a little bit about um, joints here. So we can also influence uh, what join is used by using the by using the query optimizers uh, direct hint. So loop join mm. would enforce a nested loop join. So as you can see here in our let's make this a little bit bigger in our query plan we see here we have an index scan on the persons table and then for each of this it's, since it's an inner join right for each of the uh, persons we seek if we can find in the schools table the school if yes we output it if not not we talked about this so this is a nested loop join basically doing if we have have a look here at the properties, we can also see here. Um, if, let's just execute it, and we see the actual plan, which is, is says a little bit more. Um, the actual plan tells us that the nested loop join in the end didn't take any memory. Zero, zero. As I told you, nested loop join does not need any memory. It just simply scans for each row in the person's table, each uh, row in the school's table. Okay, this is the very easy thing, right? So I think we would do the same if we just don't submit any hint because they are so small, it's uh, very effective. So if we now enter here merge join, the first problem is only the schools table is ordered on the school ID since it's their clustered index. But the person ID is not, so this will prob they will it will probably cluster in next scan the person's table and sort it. Let's see, yeah, that's exactly what I said. The schools ID can use as an index scan because it is already ordered on school ID, which is our join criteria. But the person's table is not, since the person's table has uh, not its primary key not on school ID, it needs to be sorted. And then the merge join happens, like I showed you an example. Thing is now, um, you see it right here. Eighty forty-eight percent of the whole query is uh, is used for sorting, and only twenty-four percent is used for the actual join. So it is not very efficient. If we uh, put both joins in perspective, like uh, the nested loop and the merge join. You will see that the the, the merge join with seventy-seven percent here and with twenty-three percent the nested loop join tends to be much cheaper and better for this. So now the interesting part, when we put uh, we look at the merge join, is that we do see memory usage. Requested memory, granted memory, 1024 kilobytes. So one megabyte was um, used for the sort operation. Not for the merge, but for the sort operation. I can't prove it to you, but just believe me. Um, it is the sort algorithm, uh, the sort um, operator here. Now come, we come for, to the hash join. The hash join also does not need any sort criteria. It reads both and then does the hash. We also need memory here for the hash table. And we can see this here. We need granted memory actually more than the sort. We need uh, 1056, so a little bit more than a megabyte. We need it to actually um, create the hash table um, for, I think, yeah, the schools. So the school table was the build phase and the person table was the probing phase. So, yeah. You see also here in, <coughs> in the properties, you see here, um, on the downside, I can't really go there with my mouse cursor because then the, the whole pop-up disappears, but you s can read hash key probes in the bottom. Test DB, DBO, person, school ID. And the probe residual was um, school ID from school's table and person uh, school ID from person's table, of course. So you see there, the hash keys probing was on the person's school, which also tells us that this person's table was the, the probing table and the school's table was the build table. Yeah, so that's basically it. If we compare all of them mm, with uh, our execution plans, you see uh, that the nested loop joint is the cheapest one. It takes only, if you put all of them in, in comparison, it takes only 13% 13 13 uh, of the c uh, costs. 
and um, the most expensive would be yeah it doesn't it is not so different actually um, the hash join is a little bit more cost uh, costive than the than the merge join but both of them are two big guns um, to handle um, such small tables so that's why also SQL Server if you don't put any option uh, will take the nested loop join because it is simply the cheapest as you can see here if we now go for worldwide importers for those big tables, here we have facts and dimension tables, so real big data warehouse queries. Just uh, before I close my session, we will just have a, uh, a join right here. So you see, we select everything from the sales table, fact sale, and we join it to uh, a dimension uh, like uh, a dimension like uh, what the fuck am I typing? A dimension like um, customer. And I hope it says a customer key. Yeah, the customer key is our giant criteria. And the sales table is really big. So you can see it has quite some rows here. We already selected 51,000. I don't know how many rows it actually has, but you can see it's a big table. If we join it right here in the estimated plan, you already see that um, it is taking a hash join. As I told you, um, neither of those tables is um, sorted on customer key since I guess the customer table has an uh, artificial ID somewhere yeah the customer no, it is actually sorted on the customer key but now it would have to um, in order to do a merge join it would have to s sort the whole sale table which will be ridiculous it's the bigger table so it's more cheaper to scan the customer table first do a build on it you can see here on the arrow it estimates that we have 403 rows here and we have uh, 200, approximately 228,000 rows in the other table. So it's much cheaper to build it, to build a hash table on this table, and then just take every row here and probe through the table. You can also see it here. Hash probe key is the fact sale customer key. So the fact will be probed against the build table that we have right here. But this is very effective. Um, I mean, we can just. We can just actually um, like add a rare condition if we only want a certain customer. Uh, I hope customer key is integer, so we just take customer one. Is it? Yeah. So this will. Yeah, it took not even a second, and it outputs four hundred six. Like if we now specify we want um, we want a loop join, a nested loop join. So I mean, just look at the estimated plans. Um, okay, maybe we should get rid of this where condition. This is too too good for him. Full join. A full join with hash key. Let's just run this for a moment and see how many time. Uh, how much time it needs. So it's at about two hundred thousand rows, right? was the approximation oh yeah right we are soon be there wait I'm looking for one column here yeah it will finish soon soonish so I think it will finish with 43 or something oh yeah okay here we have it 38 seconds right 38 seconds for the hash join and now let's enforce which is not wisely because then we have to scan yeah, we can actually make use of the index seek here, but I th uh, with the index seek, probably it's almost the same speed because we have an index here. We should probably um, get rid of the index to demonstrate that a loop join without any index usage is actually slower. Maybe that this uh, is now the same, uh, approximately the same speed. Should be actually be a little bit faster even since um, it doesn't need to do uh, input tables and stuff like this or probing it just scans it and seeks it let's see that uh, will be probably the same thing yeah 39 but this is just because the dimension customer has a customer key that is already uh, triggering the index C so if we if we just um, if we just take that out, if we just take that out, 
then we will be a completely different example like all the table dimension customer drop constraint what is the constraint called it is okay I just do it like this blah 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 what can it be done okay foreign key constraint okay damn it we can just uh, drop it because it has a foreign key constraint but we can copy the table and do this let's just copy the table from dimension customer we copy it into dimension customer heap so without any indexes there we go and now we do the same thing again with customer heap just uh, refresh the cache so it knows it and let's just first do again the heap uh, the, the, the hash join to see the result here Probably also be 38 seconds or approximately, but the nested loop join will be different. I can tell you because there's no index seek possible now on this table. Um, you will see a different, different time. So this we can al almost guess. We are already at 200,000. We probably have the same, about the same time. So 34 seconds this time. Hey, we're getting better at this now the loop join in your estimated plan you see already that uh, what the what the hell is he doing here um uh, scanning the table okay um the seeking um the ah now it uses the wait ah the foreign key constraint yeah 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 okay but it's still an acid loop join right Ah, it does a key look up. Ah, because we don't. Okay, I guess it. Okay, it uses the foreign key as a, as an index look up, and then we don't. We have a key look up here because it takes all the other thing. Should be still be a slower. Yeah, this is this is strange. This is a little bit strange behavior since it, there's a foreign key concern on the fact table, and so it knows actually what um what row it 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 has for the customers. Yeah, but it's, it's slower. A little bit just because it still has the foreign key concern. We should drop this as well, but I don't do this now. It is slower. Not very much though. But we had 190,000. We have 40 seconds already. We are slower. We will finish right now at 45. So it is slower. Let's just drop the, the last thing on this uh, facts table is the, the foreign key constraint to the customers and then we can really have a good idea. So let's just alter table fact say uh, drop constraint and we drop the foreign key constraint to the customer key. Um, no, this is, this is not a constraint. This is, uh, it's, I guess it's on the keys. Yeah. It is the build to customer dimension, customer here, sale, customer key, dimension, customer. If you drop this, it is still index seeking on something. Jesus, what is it index seeking on? The fake sale, foreign key. Did we get rid of the foreign key right now? Sale, customer key, fake sale, customer key. Fake sale, customer key. We get rid of this just right now. I just um option not run and recompile because I think it's confused. Fact sale FK effect sale customer key. It's an index or what? Ah yeah yeah yeah. Ah still an index. Ah, Jesus, what the, this table has really everything. Alter, uh, no, no, this is drop index on. So let's just drop also this index, Jesus Christ. What the what the hell does this all have on fact sale? Uh, just drop everything we have right here. Okay, fine. So now it should. Now, this is what I wanted to see. A nested loop join, it takes 90% of the time. So let's just run this. So the 45 seconds we can basically forget because it's still used an index that was there I didn't know about. So now. This will really take some long. 
took a while for me. <laughs> I was not prepared to do this, to be honest. It was just, just randomly I thought we, it would be a good idea. Jesus Christ. This is probably again faster because of the cash effects. <laughs> this is faster than our hash time, but it shouldn't be. It's about hash effects now we're talking about. Yeah, this is a problem when you do some performance analysis without preparation. You get screwed up numbers. Because because now it seems that this is the same the same um time that we used for the hash drum, which is it not. So um, since nobody's watching at the moment, I will just play a little while. No, it was free proc cache, right? And drop clean buffers, right? Was it? Yes. Let's just run those before we do our statements. And we run checkpoint. So this is this is to the attempt to completely clean our buffers before we run those tables, those scans. And now I would really be surprised if this is really faster than. It seems to be the same speed. Maybe it's not big enough to see the difference in hash joins. No, it's it's no no no. This time it's really slow. Yeah, it was catch effects. It was catch effects. So now we have a really good. Maybe I should edit this video and cut this the part out where we just talk crazy shit. No, it's again at two hundred thousand. Too so too fast. So yeah, obviously. It's still uh, fast enough. Check here if it's also a parallel plan. Uh, yeah, this is it's no parallel plan. Okay, last try, guys. So this is no parallel plan. So we have only one max stop, and here this was a parallel plan. This is of course unfair. So we start right here with this. I expect 30 seconds, 32, 34, something like this. Looks good. So max of one means uh, maximum degree of parallelism is one. So we have only one thread running the scan, one thread running the other scan, one thread running the hash. And it seems to be we are finished at 35. Okay, it's 35 with this setup. So if the same degree of parallelism that is no parallelism serial so one thread for each um, operator we run now this nested loop join and I'd be damned if this is faster now okay I won't be much slower though Okay, 30 seconds, we won't make it. It will be sl it will be finally slower. So you may think I just tweaked it so often that now it is finally slower, but no, this is actually the same conditions now. We have only a one thread, makes the one for both. Uh, we don't need a loop join here and a recompile. We also don't don't really need it. It's just for the plan to be recompiled. Not to, it has nothing to do with the execution of the query. And we see right here it is faster. Huh? We have over 50 seconds right now. And this is exactly what, what you can see if you directly uh, compare those two. So we finish about one minute or something. Let's just finish it and write down the, the time. It will be one minute, one minute, whatever. So one eight. And now with the same setup, I want to do a, a hash join. Uh, um, no, sorry, a merge join. It's the last one we have to to tackle. Also with uh, maximum degree of parallelism one to make it comparable. Do this shit before, and then let's just roll. The query plan looks, yeah, sort on the, sort on both tables. This is basically is nothing because it is so small, and then we have to join. This should be also very slow. 
So let's start outputting. Let's see how fast we are getting to this. Actually, it's comparable to the hash join, which is okay, which makes sense. As long as the rows are sorted, then uh, it is probably the same speed or maybe even faster is possible. So yeah, it finished also very similar to the hash joins. It's actually a little bit faster even in the setup. So this is nothing unusual. Downside is just that you have to sort it and you need memory for that sort. And if the sort uh, is somehow a little bit bigger, it can be slower to do a merge join. Okay, that's basically it. We look at our agenda. We talked about logical joins briefly. We talked extensively about physical joins. And we had a look at some execution plans and even did some uh, performance comparisons. And um, I hope you guys have a good uh, feeling now about joints. And if you have any question about joints, be it logical or physical operator, just let me know. I can, of course, do another live session or a dedicated video um, to cover something. Or also, if you have enough questions, if I get any question, <laughs> or I get uh, like five or six questions, I can also do some sessions maybe in the week for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, clarify some questions, no problem. I'm open for any feedback. Thanks for watching. I probably edit this video a little bit because we have we spent so much time on the performance part, but I will upload it in the end. So um, thanks for watching and see you next time. Next Sunday, I will do another live session or t at 8 p.m. Central European Summer Time. Topics still to be announced. Um, I think it will also have to do something with execution plans or maybe something else. I don't know. I will, be, I will uh, broadcast it uh, during the week on Twitter. So bye, thanks.